a pop-up is basically when a organization or a group of people decide to either inhabit a venue that's been disused or they just start something out of nowhere. And they'll be, for instance, in like a discarded theater, um, an old warehouse, or sometimes even in people's houses. Um, I think one of the reasons why they're considered to be pop-ups is because I think to some degree, you might need like a license to run <laughs> like restaurants and whatever, but it's quite a guerrilla revolutionary movement which has kind of taken over the city. Um, I'd say l quite a few years now, maybe the last five years at least. about being in London is that, you know, we're the capital city, so oftentimes we get everything first, you know. We'll get the artists um, who are on tour coming to London first. Um, we'll get the film premieres that take place. Um, but because we're quite used to that and we are quite spoiled, when something a little different happens, we are quite excited about it. So pop-ups, how do you find out about them? Is it word of mouth, websites? They're very much word of mouth. Um, you know, there's a few sites as well that kind of make it a mission to tell you what pop-up's happening and when. Oftentimes when we cover these pop-ups on our site, tickets will kind of sell out just as we're publishing or, you know, within hours. I mean, it's very, very popular. Um, but there's loads of them that are happening. So if you miss one, another one's going to pop up, literally. <laughs> Being somebody from the outside, does it take a while to discover the intricacies of London social life? I'd say so, because I know when I first moved to London, you kind of get caught up in the touristy side of things. So you think, oh, I need to get to Buckingham Palace at some point. Um, I need to ride a route master bus. I need to check out a telephone box. Um, and also, you know, with like the tube, <laughs> it takes a while just to kind of understand like where all the different stops are and how the city works and how you can navigate the city. Um, and so once you've kind of taken care of the basics, you then obviously have to find friends, which can take a while. We are reserved. <laughs> it took me 10 years to really dig deep and really discover, I guess, the heart of the capital. Um, you know, prior to that, for instance, the West End, there's lots of bars, there's lots of clubs, and it's actually quite easy to limit your life to that. Um, but it's only when you kind of maybe travel around the city, you discover that, you know, there's these different communities that have something, you know, going for it. Um, and something unique to it. And London seems exceptionally gifted in the art of maintaining its hidden treasures, like this bar hidden on a rooftop. London was actually the birthplace more than three centuries ago of the very select private club. Snobbery in the eyes of many, they seem to be a necessity for many elite Londoners. When we look at private members clubs, you've had places like, you know, the Groucho um, for years, unknown or at least unaccessible to, you know, the average Joe. And so I guess nowadays you could say people are creating their own sort of private and exclusive hubs in different ways, whether it's um, through a private members club which is targeted to younger people, whether it's through kind of, you know, speakeasies that are only for a certain number of people. There's a new bar actually that's opened in Shoreditch that you can only attend by invitation only. So, I mean, I think it's a bit of a trend. Yeah, I do think it's traditional, um, but I do think overall it kind of reflects how Londoners like to be. You know, we like to kind of have our own circles, our own cliques, our own crews that, you know, only a few people can access. And some private members clubs, you can't even bring your phone in. You're not even allowed taking photographs. Yeah, yeah, very true. I can imagine it's just to disconnect yourself from the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, and, and I do think to some degree, you know, private members clubs or at least exclusive um, hubs offer that. To some degree, I think it also makes it a lot more exciting. So, you know, going to somewhere that you don't know what it's like or, you know, nobody kind of knows um, sort of the fullness of what it's about, I think can be quite an appeal. I think people go to, you know, these different venues for different things. You know, private members clubs, I think primarily are uh, for people with business interests. Um, and I think supper clubs are for people who want a more sociable, community-based experience. I guess it just depends on what you're after. There is truly something for everyone in London. But if its unbridled energy seems ideal for young professionals, it can be less fit for those wishing to start a family. 
I know people who've left London purely because of that. They want to raise their kids somewhere else that's a little bit, you know, a bit more calm, a bit more suburban. I think with London, there's just so much going on. It's, it's easy for kids to get lost, I suppose, to some degree. We are going to a kind of hidden dining club called uh, Back in Five Minutes, the Disappearing Dining Club. <laughs> um, what's quite funny about it is actually it's at the back of a clothing shop, um, but that's kind of what makes it a little bit secretive and reflects that kind of exclusive private aspect that you find in London sometimes. Without a few tips from a local, it's hard to imagine how I could have found this cozy restaurant hidden at the back of a clothing store. Thank you. If you don't want to join a private members club, you can still find a lot of exclusive places here in London. We just walked through a store and opened these drapes and voila. One of the things I like about this place is that, you know, you can come in off the street, you don't have to make reservations. Um, so it's not that exclusive, it's just those in the know will come here. So this is cool for that. So the Disappearing Dining Club, that was originally a pop-up. Yeah, exactly. So now it's kind of found a regular base. Pop-ups are a good way for chefs, uh, restaurateurs to kind of feel, you know, try out the market a little bit, and then if they're really popular, they can just kind of set up home somewhere and, and see how it goes. It's funny because there's been quite a revolution with food at the moment in that street food is, has become increasingly popular. It's, it's very easy to get good food here, well-cooked food, you know, not too fatty. You can definitely get quality here. And it, it's becoming more and more diverse, definitely, yeah. I think before, to get good food in London, it was limited to very few places, because you had your fast food and your massive chains. You'd have your restaurants, but not everybody wants to go to a restaurant, make a reservation and eat. Nowadays, you get a lot of these sort of street food vendors who are doing like quality, um, kind of this home cooked food, whether it's Mexican or Indian um, or even British. Also, in um, London, you know, people who are in the food industry, they really take pride in the quality of the ingredients, so they're not just gonna, you know, slap anything together. They're gonna make sure that if you're gonna eat good food, it's gonna be really, really good food and it's gonna be memorable as well. Author Samuel Johnson wrote that when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For there is in London all that life can afford. It's hard to summarize more adequately the excitement that makes the British capital so enviable and inviting. And as London is constantly renewing itself, one lifetime probably isn't enough to see everything it has to offer. <laughs>